Uh, thank you, Michael, uh, Chris, Diane, all of you in the audience who helped make our symposium a great success every year. I want to thank Keith Davis and Jane Aspinwall, Natalie Bowden, and all the folks here at the Nelson Atkins for their support and effort on our behalf. And I would like to extend a special thank you to Mark Johnson, our ex-president, who provided some significant content for the article in the 2013 Daguerrean Annual. Today I will share with you the history I've recovered while researching that article, augmented with additional information and images, concluding with the work involved to restore the panorama. During the first year of the gold rush, the population of San Francisco had increased from 1,000 to 25,000 inhabitants. The city rapidly grew to serve the influx of fortune hunters heading for the hills. Hotels, warehouses, theaters, restaurants, and dwellings in town were constructed at a frantic pace. It has been said that three new buildings per day were appearing on the streets below the hillside, pressing up against the shoreline as the waterfront expanded into the bay on piers and wharfs. The harbor was choked with hundreds of sailing vessels abandoned by crew and passengers hoping to seek their fortune. To make room for the ceaseless tide of ships and men, the least sea seaworthy vessels were recycled for their wood or sunk to add to the foundations for wharf expansion. The ship Regulus, on which Albert Southworth arrived in March of 1849, became a floating store ship for nearly 10 years, and to this day rests under California Street. All the while the city grew at a fantastic pace, only to be reduced to ashes and built again. San Francisco suffered six major fires over the 16-month period between Christmas of 1849 and the summer solstice of 1851. Here is an illustration of the fourth great fire that occurred on September 17, 1850, centered around Portsmouth Square. The vivid and colorful history of the gold rush can be discovered in daguerreotype images taken at this time. Just take a look at the amazing exhibition here at, Nelson, at the Nelson Atkins. Let me share with you my findings about the five-plate panorama of the city of San Francisco attributed to Sterling McIntyre, its history, the context of its creation, and its recent restoration. The recent history of the panorama of San Francisco begins in the January-February 1998 issue of the Daguerrean Society newsletter. Christie's Auction House took out a full-page ad announcing an upcoming sale. The ad reproduces the second of a five-plate panorama with a description, Daguerrean unknown, view of Telegraph Hill with station, one plate from a five-plate daguerreotype panorama of San Francisco, <coughs> 1850s, estimate $20,000 to $30,000. Christie's auction house previewed the piece in Paris and Los Angeles, and according to Rick Wester, the original frame was in poor condition, not able to withstand the rigors of travel it was replaced with a modern metal frame. On the evening of the sale, Matthew Eisenberg had spoken to gold rush collector Stephen Anaya in, from California, who told him that the daguerreotypes were originally in a wooden frame. From taped interviews with Matthew about his collection made in 2012, I learned that on the day of the sale, he was feeling unwell with a temperature of 104 degrees, yet he arrived early to track down the original frame knowing that it could add several thousand dollars to the value of the plates. He asked a woman from Christie's to go downstairs and search for it. A half hour later, she returned to the auction floor with the frame in hand. Matthew then asked for the wooden backing boards. She went downstairs again to retrieve the panels, and again she returned with them. He then asked her for the original framing nails. <laughs> At this point, the woman had had enough because the sale was about to begin. Matthew simply had to have the gold rush panorama for his collection, and was prepared to pay 20 times the low estimate, if necessary. My friend Ken Nelson tells me that he was in the sale room at the time, sitting next to Keith Davis, and when lot 106 came up, Matthew simply held his hand and did not lower it until the hammer fell. Now let's discuss the provenance of the panorama from the beginning. From a timing perspective, Rick Wester from Christie's determined that it had to have made, been made before the great San Francisco fire on June 22, 1851. This fire destroyed the First Presbyterian Church, as can be seen in the second plate. In terms of maker, though, Christie's listed the panorama as unknown. 
Wester speculated that the maker may be Dr. Sterling C. McIntyre, based on a reference from Beaumont Newhall's The Daguerreotype in America. On page 86, Newhall described a notice from the San Francisco Daily Paper, the Alta California, dated February 1st, 1851. Newhall, however, had discovered, uh, and he sourced a, re a reprint. The first printing of this notice was January 19th, 1851, which described a consecutive series of daguerreotype plates, five in number, arranged side by side so as to give a view of our entire harbor. The views, taken by McIntyre, were intended for the great exhibition at London's Crystal Palace. The article reads, this picture, although the first attempt, is nearly perfect. It goes on to say, McIntyre's panorama was available for viewing at the Alta California's office and duplicates could be had for $100. Duplicates in this instance is meaning variant copies. Speaking of variant copies, it is very likely the Alta California was describing McIntyre's five-plate panorama in the collection of the George Eastman Museum that was illustrated alongside Lot 106 in the catalog. According to their records, the East Museum purchased this piece in 1951 from Joseph A. Heckel in New York City. So who was Sterling McIntyre? Sterling C. McIntyre was trained as a dental surgeon in Paris by American expatriate Dr. Cyrus Starr Brewster, graduating in 1840. It's interesting to note that McIntyre was in Paris in 1839 when the daguerreotype process was revealed. In 1844, McIntyre was advertising himself as a dentist and daguerreotypist in Tallahassee, Florida, and then moving on to South Carolina. By the end of the decade, McIntyre was operating a studio at 663 Broadway in New York. This portrait, stamped McIntyre, is in the J.P. Getty collection and was likely taken in the southern states. Dr. Dr. McIntyre left the East for the gold rush, as did thousands of others. He arrived in San Francisco on November 21, 1850, on board the U.S. mail steamer California. It was, a duty, it was the duty of the ship captain, Thomas Budd, to publish a list of the passengers and goods in the daily paper offices at California Alta. The passenger and list, list includes the famous John C. Fremont, whose later westward expedition was retraced by contemporary Daguerrean Robert Slayer in sites once seen. However, our interest is in passenger J.C. McIutire, which is, of course, our man McIntyre. An S can easily be uh, misread as a J when handwriting is transcribed, and the typesetter further confused matters by placing the N in the composting stick upside down. Within three weeks of his arrival, McIntyre opened a dentist office in Dr. Rabe's building at number 2 Clay Street three doors west of Montgomery Street. Although he operated portrait studios prior to and after this time, he never advertised for daguerreotype sittings in San Francisco, preferring to focus on views. The earliest mention of McIntyre's views is dated January 28, 1851. It describes a row of buildings along the north side of Portsmouth Square on Washington Street, including the newspaper office of the Alta California. Of importance here is that the note, uh, it notes that McIntyre is getting up the panorama of San Francisco for the World's Fair. This would seem that he's working on it, but has yet to complete it. The view of the plaza described is this daguerreotype in the collection of the Library of Congress. This and one other single plate are the earliest known views of San Francisco taken by McIntyre. Here's a closer look. All of the buildings on this row were built after the fire of May 4, 1850, which destroyed the entire block. In this view, we can see from west to east along the plaza the following buildings. The California Restaurant, the Alta California, the newspaper office, a drugs and medicines wholesaler and retailer, an unnamed white building, three figures standing on the plaza as mentioned in the Alta article, and the Louisiana Bella Union at Sociedad Hotels. The other singular view by McIntyre is also at the Library of Congress. Both plates are part of the David D. Porter family papers. 
Porter was a shipmaster on the SS Georgia, which ran the Atlantic route from the Panama to New York, in sync with the SS California on the Pacific side. McIntyre did not stay long in San Francisco, working for about two months, taking singular and panoramic views in January and February. On February 19th, his dental office on Clay Street was listed for rent, and by April he had moved to Nevada City. On July 1st, 1851, the Daguerrean Journal reported that McIntyre suffered severe losses in the May 4th, 1851 fire and that they had received at their office one five-panel panorama of San Francisco and six gold rush views framed together, all half-plates sent from McIntyre. This panorama is very likely the plate now in the Eastman Museum. I will now like to discuss McIntyre's views by looking at the minute de details to help understand precisely when they were made. This singular view was taken from Knob Hill looking down onto the city, including Portsmouth Square, and beyond to the harbor. Let's now focus on Portsmouth Square, otherwise known as the plaza. Here's a letter sheet made by the lithographer Benjamin Franklin Butler of San Francisco showing the east side of Portsmouth Square and the buildings along Kearney Street. The letter on this letter sheet is dated February 15, 1851. So we know that, lith that this lithograph was certainly made before then. If we focus on the buildings between Washington and Market Street on Kearney, we see from left to right the El Dorado Hotel, the Parker House containing the Jenny Lynn Theater, and, U and then the Union Hotel. Only the El Dorado Hotel, a brick structure, would survive the fifth great fire on May 4, 1851. Incidentally, the Parker House burned in all the six great fires and was quickly rebuilt. After its last destruction, it emerged as a much larger building made from fire-resistant res Australian sandstone. Anyhow, notice that the Parker House in this letter sheet has a prominent sign attached to the roof. It's not installed on the roof in the Library of Congress view. This clearly indicates that the view was made sometime between McIntyre's arrival in late November and mid-February. We could be more precise if we knew when the date the letter sheet was printed or the date the sign was installed. This would be really helpful because in the National Gallery of Canada, Canada panorama, the sign is installed on the roof. Nevertheless, we have other clues. On December 11, 1850, the Alta California mentions this lithograph of the Grand Plaza at Portsmouth Square. Incidentally, we can see that the lithographer Benjamin F. Butler, who made this and the previous lithograph, had his workshop in the post office building on the left. The notice states that the lithograph does not exactly resemble the plaza as it is now. The fine row of buildings between the post office and Washington Street are not yet built. Washington Street, in the center distance of the lithograph, has the same row of buildings, including the Alta California newspaper office, as seen in the Library of Congress daguerreotype. In red, I've outlined the buildings that were added, but not there yet. To reinforce how rapidly things progressed in construction, the notice concludes a sketch at any point in time would barely be recognized a week later. In the Library of Congress plate detail, we can see, once again, the El Dorado Hotel, the Parker House on the east side of the plaza, without the sign on it, the same row of buildings on the north side of the plaza on Washington Street, as seen in the Library of Congress other plate, and a brand new building being constructed that did not exist on December 11th between Washington Street and the post office, as can be seen here framed in red. There's no siding on this, on this. it's just the, uh, just the framing at this point. Here's a close-up view of the George Eastman Museum, uh, plate three in the panorama. That structure has now been sided and is nearly finished clearly showing that it was made after the Library of Congress singular view from Knob Hill. 
It's difficult here to see if the Parker House has its roof sign due to the mat, so we need another way to determine which panorama was made first, the Eastman House or the, or the one here on exhibition. <clears throat> the three plates showing Portsmouth Square all have the same building with an adjoining shed in the foreground. A red dot indicates the sloped roof shed in each of the daguerreotypes. And the green dot points to a new building in the National Gallery of Canada panorama, which had been an empty lot to the left, as seen in the other two plates. So to recap, the Library of Congress view was made first, sometime after December 11th and before February 15th, based on that letter sheet. The Eastman House panorama was made after that date, but before the National Gallery of Canada panorama. I had previously determined the latter panorama was likely made before March 6th. That's the only date that its original owner, Captain Wood, piloted the SS New Orleans into San Francisco that coincides with the dates of its creation. Of course, Wood could have purchased it at a later date, but it's highly unlikely with the destruction of McIntyre's office and the Daily Alta in the May 4th and June 22nd fires. Recently, I've found a small detail that may indicate a more precise date for the making of the McIntyre panorama. <clears throat> in revisiting my digital micrographs of the fifth plate, a steamer looking very much like the SS California is in the distance. <clears throat> According to the Alta California, the Pacific Mail steamer California was in San Francisco twice monthly. So if this is indeed the SS California at anchor, we can now date its panorama most likely to have been taken on February 13th, 14th, or 15th, or on its next visit, February 27th, 28th, or March 1st. Moving on to conservation efforts. The lot description describes the Christie sale. It's opening with five plate daguerreotypes forming a panorama of San Francisco, the middle plate tarnished. An understatement if there ever was one. After the sale, Matthew Eisenberg sent all five plates to the conservation lab at the George East Museum in Rochester, New York, for evaluation. Roger Watson, then Grant Romer's assistant, was careful to document every item that entered the conservation lab. He still had the ectochrome slots that showed the conditions of the plates in 1998. <clears throat> Comparing the condition of the plates in 1998 with the above photograph in 2013, it indicates that the plates had not changed that much at all. Over the 16 years, it was on display in Matthew's attic gallery, color balance notwithstanding. At any rate, the conservators at the Eastman House advised that the center plate was too far gone to treat, and the plates were returned to Matthew untouched. Matthew displayed it as it was, prominently on the shelf above his gallery vitrines. He printed this label to hide the center plate, which read in part, the middle plate awaits a process to restore the image that may still exist under the presently fogged plate. The first time I visited Matthew in Hadline, Connecticut was in 2001. At the time, we talked about the condition of the panorama, panorama and since I was a practicing daguerreotypist, he wondered if I could make a new daguerreotype from a copy photograph to fill in the gap. We never got together to attempt the project while Matthew owned it. When the Eisenberg collection came to Toronto and I began to work with the collection, I turned my attention again to the panorama, looking for a solution for the problem of the center plate. I'd recently read an article explaining how phot photographing a daguerreotype using near-infrared hyperspectral light could reveal obscured image detail, and I wondered if there was a way to somehow see through the silver sulfide on the plate. Here's an example of an imaging technique to illustrate the effect. The co-author of the article was Greg Hill, photographs conservator at the Canadian Conservation Institute in Ottawa. Greg and I have known each other for years since we taught workshops together uh, in Ottawa. So together we attempted hyperspectral imaging of the center plate 
to see if any image details could be recovered digitally. Unfortunately, the, the success of this method <clears throat> is very limited. Once the tarnishing level exceeds a certain point, nothing is seen. I was not willing to attempt tarnish removal on a plate this far gone. So the best non-invasive option was to create a new plate by copying another extant daguerreotype. The center plate from the George Eastman Museum panorama was a close match, but not perfect, as the field of view presented as only two-thirds of the scene that needed to be uh, replaced. Combining the details from the third plate with the adjacent second plate was not an option because the brass mats blocked a good deal of the, of the uh, important uh, information I needed. <clears throat> Another panorama from 1853 with six full plates in the collection of the Oakland Museum of California had the needed areas of hillside and horizon in its third plate. So the replacement image would have to be a collage from two other panoramas. I began some preliminary digital work and quickly realized things, <clears throat> two things had to happen. First, the visible yet foggy plates needed to be restored to reveal important details to help with the digital reconstruction for the center image. And second, my Photoshop skills were not up to the task. I needed an expert. So here are the four plates before and after I electro clean them. I decided to give them a light treatment leaving much of the perimeter tarnish intact, reason being that these plates had been taken apart at some time in their history and there were matte abrasions and wipes. I wanted to preserve some of the original patina to minimize the visibility of these condition issues. So here's plate one. Uh, before and after treatment. There's the second plate and the fourth plate. Here we can see the ships in the harbor more clearly. And the uh, final right hand plate terminating at Rincon Point. While I had the plates unsealed I took the opportunity to take digital Im images with my microscope. In plate one, here's the Phoenix Bakery, an appropriate name considering all the fires. There's the Golden Gate Hotel. In plate two, we can see Tammany Hall. And my personal favorite, a workman up on a ladder with his faithful dog waiting below. In plate four, we see the El Dorado Hotel and the Parker House on Kearney Street at Portsmouth Square. And the Veranda Hotel on Washington Street. And in the foreground, we see a carpenter with his saw on a scaffold. Finally, in the fifth plate, the forest of ship mass in the bay near Rincon Point. For the second part of the rest of the conservation effort, I teamed up with Carson Jones. Carson is one of the premier digital artists in Toronto. Carson provided this series of screenshots to illustrate the progress of the digital composting. The perspective was not exact because the Eastman House was taken from a vantage point further south on Knob Hill. So we had to correct the distortion to realign the, the horizon. The Oakland view was more of a correct perspective so that really helped in the transition between plate two and plate three. I made attempts with just using the Eastman House but with the difficulties of the mats and the preservers basically dissecting the view and the extreme angle, it was extremely difficult to make a seamless transition from plate two to plate 
4. Finally, we had to extrapolate some of the missing elements, such as the, uh, the house in the foreground. And we printed a digital file on a very large sheet of matte surface paper in reverse. And then I made a daguerreotype, copying the print while adjusting the sensitizing to yield uh, an image color that hopefully closely matched the tone of the original four plates. So here's the final result. It's certainly not perfect. There are buildings from the 1853 composite that really shouldn't be there. I hope you'll agree that it serves the purpose. The goal here was to make an image presentable for museum exhibition. The center image, although one, not 100% accurate, completes the panorama seamlessly for, for the general audience. So here is the five plate panorama before conservation and after. This is essentially the end of my story as published in 2013 in the Daguerrean Annual. However, only a few weeks ago, new information was brought to my attention by Nick Wright, who is Jason Wright's brother. <clears throat> he sent me this. In 1964, the Journal of the San Francisco Maritime Museum, the Sea Letter, ran a story titled Gold Rush Panoramas, San Francisco, 1850 to 1853. Peter Palmquist mentions this in a footnote in our first Daguerrean Annual, but I must admit neither I nor Matthew Eisenberg was aware of its contents. This article reproduced the George Eason Museum panorama over a three-page spread pointing out specific architectural details that were lost in the May 4th fire of 1851 to show that this panorama as long was among the earliest known views of San Francisco. This was the same fire that destroyed Sterling McIntyre's dentist office, causing him to leave San Francisco for good and relocate to Mount, uh, Nevada City. The first page of the Sea Letter Journal reproduces two center prints of a panorama of San Francisco from 1851. The article explains that the panorama originally existed in five parts, of which only four remain, and these four only in paper copies made long ago from the now lost daguerreotypes. These copies are in the collection of the California Historical Society. And they wrote, alas, because of the loss of detail in copying, they contribute little to our study of the shipping. For that detail, we can only wait for the discovery of the original daguerreotypes. Here's the carpenter I showed you earlier from plate number four, visible in the copy photograph. I have to uh, thank Nick Wright for bringing this to my attention. The daguerreotypes assumed to be lost in 18, 1964 have been found and came to light in 1998. According to Christie's, it came from the family of Samuel Bigelow Wood, a sea captain from San Francisco. As I mentioned, Bigelow Wood commanded the SS New Orleans making panoramic runs between Panama, Panama City and San Francisco, steaming through the Golden Gate four times, September 24th and, Dece and December 11th, 1850, on March 6th and May 3rd, 1851. He may have seen this amazing daguerreotype on his third visit, March 6th, while stopping at the Alta California to report his cargo to passengers. These copies, held by the California Historical Society, were made from McIntyre's five-plate panorama many, many years ago, and that panorama was still in uh, California, and, and the center plate was still in good condition. This panorama moved east to the mid, in the mid-1940s with Bigelow's descendants and was unknown to the people at the San Francisco Maritime Museum. On the right is the daguerreotype superimposed over the print. And here on the left, finally, is a glimpse behind that thick black tarnish that we all worked so hard to replace. 